Good morning, church. Y'all doing okay? My buddy Matt lived in Colorado for a summer, and with living in Colorado for a summer, he uh, lived in a spot called the Collegiate Peaks. There's a town called Buena Vista, Colorado. Collegiate Peaks, in order to be one, you pretty much have an Ivy League name like Yale or Princeton or Harvard, and you got to be over 14,000 feet tall. And so my buddy Matt, for a summer, worked as a raft guide and literally lived uh, among the mountains, came home and came home with a story. The story starts, it says, if you can get up to the top of a place called Cottonwood Pass, uh, which is right smack dab in the middle of the mountains, if you can get there at night, the game is this. You get to the very top. There is not a street light. There is, there's literally not a town close. It is pitch dark, just blackness over the mountain. If you can get to the top of Cottonwood Pass, you can literally drive up there, take the Suburban up there. You get there, and he said that the best thing to do at the top of Cottonwood Pass is literally to get out a longboard. Um, this is a terrible idea. Uh, but to get out a longboard, get out your rollerblades, because I was born in the 80s, and we have those, uh, and literally go from 12,126 feet down to about eight, five, nine thousand 9,000 feet. If you know anything, if you've ever driven those roads in Colorado, they're called switchbacks. They literally do this. They Z down the side of the mountain. Uh, it is a quick descent. And uh, he told this story uh, upon returning back to Lubbock, uh, where we were living at the time, after his summer in Colorado. And uh, he told it for about a year. We take our students up, our high school students at the time, to the same spot just across the street, and they would raft and, and hike and rock climb and all that stuff. And we literally just gotten back, and Matt came up with the idea, hey, let's, uh, let's do it. Just leaders. Let's take eight guys. Um, we we're all in our kind of mid-20s at the time. Let's just go up. It's nine hours from here. I was exhausted. Did not want to go immediately back to Colorado, but here we go. Uh, we literally got in the car. Two guys I need you to remember. One is my buddy Matt. He was the raft guy that knows back and forth everything about Colorado. Uh, two is a guy that would become his future father-in-law. His name is Rick, and we'll call him Tricky Ricky for the rest of this time. Uh, that is his nickname. You can ne you, you just... He's just the man. He is the best fisherman I have met in Texas. Uh, he loves to fly fish, and the whole reason Tricky Ricky is on the trip, we needed a father figure on the trip, and two, we need somebody that could teach us how to fish. So our goal going up there, one, let's get to the top of that mountain in the dark and longboard and rollerblade down, and two, every other moment we're just going to fish. So we did it. Um, leading up to that moment, we didn't probably call it practice, but if you're going to go down 3,000 feet, um, you probably need to practice, right? Um, so here's what we do. If you've ever been to Lubbock, Texas, you know there's no place to practice, okay? It's not there. West Texas literally is the ele it's actually 3,000 feet above sea level, but literally there's no elevation change from there. So here's our idea. We went to the Texas Tech garage, okay? This is what happens. It's six, seven stories. It is the biggest mountain in town. So what we do, we drive to the top on a Saturday when students aren't there. I kid you not. Drive to the top. You get out, get your rollerblades out, put them on, or your skateboard, whatever you need, and you can literally zigzag down that grade of that parking garage till you go from floor six to floor one. Here's the coolest thing. It is a redneck ski lift. Why? Because you get to the bottom of one, and lo and behold, there's an elevator, Okay, it's beautiful. You literally hit the button. Um, there was a really random professor that got on there one time, and he was looking at me. I've got rollerblades on and a helmet. Um, he looks at, what are you doing? He didn't say a word, but you got the look. And like, okay, we probably need to leave. About an hour later, we were escorted off the premises by Texas Tech Campus Security, and that made a whole lot of sense. Uh, but for the time, we got a little bit of practice in. So we are literally going, okay, um, we're going to use that practice that we didn't really realize was practice. This is going to be how we do it. We're going to go to the top of this mountain, and we're going to come down pretty quick. We all pile in Tricky Ricky's car. He is our driver. He knows the way. Um, he doesn't care at all about what a longboard is. He is not getting on a pair of rollerblades. He is the father figure that will literally pump the brakes all the way down the mountain going about two miles an hour. I kid you not. Uh, we get to the top. Actually, before we get to the top, on our way up, you can't really see much. You are in almost a... Uh, just a spot where you can't see much. We'll call it that. Uh, literally, I'm in the, the back seat on the right side, and I see what looks like a firework just come right over us. 
I'm like, that was interesting. July 4th was probably two weeks before. Um, somebody's having fun. Um, discounted at that point, so they're just launching. That was really close. It was, it was awesome. It was completely just whitish gold, and I had not seen a firework like that. I was like, that's neat. Didn't think about it. We get to the top of the mountain. There's a spot where you've got that really cool state park wooden structure that tells the altitude at 12,126. We get out. Rick turns the car around. The only light within any sort of sight is the headlights of the Suburban. Matt's first stop. He jumps out, gets on his longboard, and starts doing these turns like this because if you get too much speed, it's pretty much over for you. Um, in fact, one of his best friends had broken his leg two weeks before. Like, this is a bad idea. Long story short, Matt n literally does not get 30 seconds of longboarding in before all of a sudden these fireworks start coming literally over the top of the mountain and literally over the top of our car. And what we had noticed in that moment, we had almost zoomed out in a way to get to the top of the mountain. And in that moment, we landed smack dab in the most beautiful meteor shower I had ever seen in my entire life. There is not a street light. There is not a town light. There is nothing but pitch black dark. And all of a sudden, literally, the longboard got put away in that moment. Rick stops the car. Tricky Ricky, I'm sorry. Uh, stops the car. Turns off the lights. And literally, I'm a kid just in a candy store. I, I literally sit up in the window of the Suburban with my, with my arms on the luggage rack on the top, just staring straight up. And y'all, they are screaming over the mountain at us. What looked kind of, kind of cool from this moment was unbelievably cool when you changed your viewpoint. And here's what we've got to do. To understand Romans 12, 1 and 2, and you're like, oh, Romans 12 is today. Yes, it is. Welcome to the party. Here we go. To understand Romans 12, you have to zoom out, okay? You have to change your perspective. In fact, Paul argues that this must happen at the beginning of Romans 12. You have to zoom out to see it for what it is. And as we looked out over Colorado at the top of Cottonwood Pass at 12,000 feet, you saw, I saw the coolest thing I had ever seen in the Lord's creation. You could hear the booms from them breaking up in the atmosphere. It was unbelievable to see, and it's something we would not have seen truly over here. You change your viewpoint and get over here and zoom out, and you will see how truly beautiful Romans 12 is is. So let's do this. Let's stand up and let's read it together. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, uh, like every Sunday, you're going to need it. Uh, this scripture is good. Let me just tell you this. This scripture, because it's Romans, it's incredibly thick. It is weighty. But here's what I will say, and I will argue it till the day I die. The beauty of this weighty scripture is that it is incredibly freeing at the same time. The truths and the mercies that you're about to see are incredibly freeing, and we'll walk through this. But here is 12, 1 and 2, book of Romans. Paul says it this way, speaking to Christians. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, friends but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to this age, but instead transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's pray together. Jesus, your word's true. We hold your book to be the highest, to hold it in the highest of regard. This book changes us. Spirit, have your way with our hearts this morning. Show us. When all God's people said, you may be seated. Here's the fun part of Romans 12.1. He says, therefore. It literally starts off saying, therefore, and Mike has trained us well. Whenever we see that word, what do we have to do? It's very simple. You got to look back. You got to look back. So literally, Romans 12 starts out saying, therefore, brothers and sisters, it is addressed to Christians. Now, if you're not a believer in the room today, focus in and listen and walk with us. Welcome. But Paul specifically addressing Christians here as we move through this particular passage, this text. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, and here's where your viewpoint, you have to zoom out, and Paul says it's got to happen. He says, in view of God's mercies. In other words, you've got to look at Romans 12 through his mercies. Where's his mercies at? Where, where do they come? 1 through 11. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, do this. Well, there's no way that you and I can understand Romans 12 unless we viewed his mercies that are in Romans 1 through 11. And you know where I'm going. And no, I'm not going to sit here and read Romans 1 through 11 to us right now. Okay? Would it be beneficial and great for us? Yes. Okay? Here's what I want to do. I've been searching out this scripture, have been walking through the text for a little while now. And what I want to do is I've picked five spots where mercy is almost incomprehensible in the first 11 chapters of, of Romans. And out of this mercy, sacrifice comes. From mercy comes sacrifice. And maybe we just change it up for a second today. Let's just take these spots in Romans 1 through 11 and let's think about them and let them change our hearts for a minute so that we can honestly and truthfully and rightly understand Romans 12. Check this out. Five things. We'll walk through it. Romans 1, 7. Focus on the mercies that you're about to hear. Let's just read them as a family, myself as well. Romans 1, 7. In his address, to start out the letter, Paul says, to all who are in Rome, loved by God and called as what? Say it louder. It's okay. This can be an informational moment. Saints. He doesn't call you a sinner, believer. He calls you a saint, meaning if you have come to faith in Jesus, he is saying you are not just a sinner. You have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. It has been spilt for you, his blood. And if you've given him your life and surrendered your all, you get a new name. And that name is Saint. And if you can't find the mercy in that, let's just sit for a minute in it. Believer, this is your name. Not given by me. I'm a nobody. But somehow this somebody decided to call me a saint upon belief in you too. For me, that changes things. 1-7, he calls you a saint. Romans 3, you might know it well, starting in verse 22 says it this way, let this sit on your heart. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. Famous verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Needs to be a famous verse, 24, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is available in Christ Jesus. Romans 4 talks about Abraham. 420 through 25. It said, Abraham did not waver in his unbelief at God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was in fact able to do. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, to get this, the words credited to him were not written for Abraham alone, church family, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Two more. Romans 6 comes in at 22. I can't shake this right now. But since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification. And the outcome is, quote, eternal life, exclamation point. If you love punctuation, our English teachers in the room, you're going to dig that. Paul is pumped about the fact that this word, that these mercies have the power to change your heart for eternal life and also contain the power to transform your thinking as a believer every day. Every day. Let me say it one more time. Paul is stoked, pumped, jazzed at the fact that literally this word, these mercies, Romans 1 through 11, can turn your heart to salvation. And after that moment, every day, transform your thinking to look more like Christ's thinking. It changes things. Last one. If you don't know Romans 8 well, I beg you to know it well. It's good for the soul. 
It's good for it. Romans 8, verse 1. Actually, let's do this. I haven't done this. Uh, can we, uh, if you want to put that on the screen, um, actually, don't do that. I didn't give you guys that thing. If you've got Romans uh, 8, verse 1 and 2 and 3, can we just read it together? Is that fine? Because it is, it's for all of us. Maybe as a symbol of that, let's read it together. Here we go. Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. Let's stop there. It says, there is no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. My question to that is, do you believe it? Have you let it sit and just start working in your soul? Preach that gospel to yourself every morning. These are mercies that are absolutely true. And my, my beg to you, my thought to you, um, I would beg you is this week when you get time is to sacrifice moments so you can get into Romans 1 through 11. Because the more you get into 1 through 11, Paul says it's got to happen. It says in view of 1 through 11 of those mercies, here's how 12 works. Let's check it out. Romans 12. Here we go. We've got a little bit of a baseline for it now. Let's walk in it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true worship. This living sacrifice idea. It's interesting. What Paul does is he's smart. Okay? He contrasts quickly, uh, literally, the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, you have this sacrificial system. If Israel wasn't right with God, what happened? They had to have a sacrifice in order to make things right. So what they would do is they will find an unblemished animal, and they will sacrifice that animal on an altar to make things right with God. Here's the cool thing. That was the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. When the New Testament and the New Covenant comes in through Jesus, you get this Savior King who goes, Goes, I know there's been sacrifices for a really long time, but listen to me, I'm it from now on. This is the last one. Once and for all, this is my job. Happy to do it. Called to do it. Sent by the Father to do it. The crazy thing is this, and it blows my mind to think about it. You go back to Genesis in the beginning when we goofed it up. And I say we, you and I are in the same line as Adam and Eve. We are humans. We are mankind. And thus, we've got a broken sin nature. God knew what was going to happen in the garden. It happened. And in that moment, out of his great mercy, which changes my heart, he goes, you know what? They deserve a penalty. They've got to have a penalty. They've got to have something happen because they have sinned. And in his goodness to you and his goodness to me, he goes, I'll be the penalty. And I'll send the exact representation of myself, Scripture says, in the form of his son, his perfect one. He goes, I'll, I'll be the penalty. And in so doing, church, completely takes the idea of sacrifice and literally places it on its head. Literally goes like this. What sacrifice meant in the old covenant? Death. What sacrifice for the king Jesus in the new covenant for you and for me? He brings life. The illustration has completely changed because of what Jesus has done. We are now living sacrifices. Now, it moves from living sacrifices to then go, yeah, you need to be holy. You need to be holy. Our city, Nashville, Tennessee, Williamson and Davidson County, they need to see you and they got to see me be the same guy all the time. They need me to be holy. They need me to be a person that loves this book, that will talk about this book from five steps up, but maybe more importantly, will walk off this stage and truly live it daily. They got to have it. If you're a non-believer in this room, can I just say, I, we are going to do our best to show you the truth and authenticity of King Jesus. That's our aim. That's what a living sacrifice does. We want to be holy before him. Okay? And then it essentially moves next to true worship. And some scriptures might say spiritual act of worship is presenting yourself as a living sacrifice. 
I didn't get what that exactly meant until I was sitting in a coffee shop back in Texas, and literally I had no idea at 24 which way was up. Now, some of you are 24 and under, and you know which way was up. Congratulations. Um, I literally had no idea what I was doing in life. Um, I knew I'd been called there, but I was like, how do I maintain consistently, consistency as I teach these students and as I try to be in the Word? How do I do that? Because here's my schedule. It's crazy. And the guy sitting across from me literally goes, hey, write everything down. Write your average day. Write it all down. And I'm like, okay, how busy could a 24-year-old kid be? So I wrote it from waking up to first staff meeting to lunch here at the school to afternoon meeting to um, running to play soccer with the guys afterwards to going to get something to eat, whatever it was that day. And I know your schedule is probably 10 times busier than mine. But he said, write it all down. So I wrote it all down on a napkin, okay? Uh, We had computers, no paper, stole a napkin. It's literally on a napkin. I challenge you to do it too. And I wrote it all down, and this guy says to me, these are not obstacles for you being a sacrifice. It's actually he's presented you with the perfect opportunity. In every spot from the boardroom to the staff meeting to lunch with that guy or seeing that neighbor uh, doing his yard. Those are God-given appointments to live sacrificially, truly, and authentically before this city that needs Jesus badly. So what does it look like? And I urge you when we leave this place and you get a moment alone to just think through these mercies of God, write out your schedule. Yeah, you never know that email is going to show up out of nowhere. It's going to wreck your whole day and you're going to have to reshape and reframe. But how do you, even in that moment of getting an email where everything changes, you show up and go, okay, God, you knew this was going to happen. How do I live sacrificially in this situation for the glory of God and your kingdom? Holy, pleasing. It says it this way. Verse 1, it's all about committing. It is the act of committing. Verse 2, it's all about staying the course. He starts it this way. Verse 2, here we go. Do not be conformed to this age. How are we doing with that? We doing okay? Yeah, yeah, some of that. Okay, we're working on it. Uh, Do not be conformed to this age, but transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. The transformation word is called, it says be transformed. It is a present tense verb saying this is an ongoing process process. I used to think when I, this, this verse right here, I used to think when I was transformed, that was the moment of salvation. But Paul has already said, I'm talking already to believers. Okay. So he's saying this, Hey, believer, you can be transformed in your mind and in your thinking. How? By meditating, looking, studying, digging into the first 11 chapters of Romans and the entire rest of the Bible. The Greek word, if you go all the way back, and you don't have to know this, is metamorpho, and that's literally when Jesus is transfigured, okay? Mark 9 uses that word, okay? You go to 2 Corinthians, uses the same word, but it is applied to the believer, meaning your countenance, your heart, every part of you is a living sacrifice that can be daily transformed into his likeness. Mike has told you guys, he showed up in and, and our life groups. We have worship every Wednesday night in the fall and the spring, and we dedicated a night to open mic night with Mike. Well, yeah, that was what it was. Um, open mic night with Mike. We should have changed the title. Uh, long story short, Mike comes in, and he, I said, Mike, students are going to ask you questions for an hour. Are you good with that? He goes, yeah. And I was like, do you want them to, like, text them in so that we can filter? Because you never know what kids are going to say these days. He goes, do not protect me. Okay. Yes, 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 sir. Um, yes, sir, I'm, I'm going to leave now. And uh, don't protect me. Just let me go up and let's, let's walk through all of their theological questions, all of their cultural questions, everything they're seeing in high school, everything they're seeing in middle school. Let them bring it. And I learned in that moment from Mike Glenn that the word has a response to everything. And he answered those questions with the word for an hour, so much so that our senior guy's life group uh, came in and said, hey, uh, we want you to come for an hour with us. We've got more questions. And literally they did. Mike showed up, there's a pile of Chick-fil-A which was gone in literally 10 seconds and those boys came in and their phones, their notepads on their phones were full of questions. In fact, one of our guys wouldn't let anybody else talk till he got through with his about eight, nine questions, Uh, literally. And it was incredible because in that moment I could visibly see these young men see what is happening in our culture and go, there's gotta be a world, a biblical 
answer to this worldly problem. And Mike sat there for more than an hour and walked them through scripture. And they dug into the text so that then they could go out and be truth as living sacrifices. I learned in that moment that without this book, it is impossible to be a living sacrifice. Completely. There is no power in me that is any good on my own. But with this book, everything changes. And the spirit moves. I love that Paul, when he says, I urge you, you guys see that part when at the beginning of Romans 12, he says, I urge you, I urge you, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. What I love about that is Paul does not say, I command you to follow this. Out of his passion for what has happened in his heart, in Romans 1 through 11, he says, check this out, my heart's different. Check this out, my heart's different. Not follow this, follow that. It's literally watch what happens when you get close to Jesus. It changes everything. Living sacrifice. Our world in this moment is aching for us to sacrifice. Aching for me to get my life connected to Jesus so that they can see who he is. Aching for it. Let me show you an example. There's a guy named Bart Ehrman, professor, UNC Chapel Hill. Okay, doesn't follow Jesus, um, doesn't uh, proclaim to be a follower of Christ, but here's what he says. Literally at the beginning of every, uh, I think it's annual class that he's got, non-believing professor asked this question. I want to read it for you. Um, this is listed in Tony Morita's book. He is a pastor at Imago Dei in Raleigh, North Carolina, and in his book he lists this. It says, Bart Ehrman tells of an annual scene in one of his classes at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He asked the class, quote, how many of you believe the Bible is inspired by God? End quote. He reports that quite a high percentage of students raise their hands. Okay. Then he asks, how many of you have read, insert, popular author's latest book? How many of you have read this book that's out there right now? Virtually everyone raises his hand. And then he asked, how many of you have read the entire Bible? Cover to cover. Almost no one raises a hand. Ehrman points out, this non-believer points out the inconsistency of this practice. Saying, quote, I understand why you would want to read this popular author. But if you really believe God wrote a book, wouldn't you want to read it? End quote. And I sat there in my own heart and I said, okay, Mr. Ehrman is literally aching for his class to literally show him what sacrificial love of being just full of Christ, what it is. Full of, it's not a guilt trip. Don't hear me say that. But what I am saying is culture today needs the biblical worldview and the only way that I'm going to get it The only way that you're going to get it is by pressing our minds into this book as believers and daily being transformed by the goodness of his mercy. That's the only way this thing happens. You literally have to get to a spot like that moment on top of that mountain in Colorado where you can back up and see the whole scope of Scripture for what it is. And in that moment, you will be in awe of the beauty. But Paul says in Romans 12, You have to do this in view of his mercy first. That's where it's got to start. The key to transformational thinking as the believer, as a believer, is jumping into his abundant mercy and studying it, getting alone with God and walking from there. That's what our high schools need. That's what your workplace needs. That's what my family needs. That's what your family needs. That's what our church needs. Paul argues, go after Jesus and watch what happens. I can't give you homework. It's not my job. But what I I will say is this. Romans 1 through 11, absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. And out of that mercy flows sacrifice for the kingdom. If you don't know Jesus, you've, you've never given your life to him. You've never given him your heart. We want you to have a moment to do that this morning. If you do not know him, David's gonna come up and play. Literally, there are spots that you can find. If you go right out these doors and right over here out of this room, 
in the parlor, we wanna meet with you. If that is too far and you get lost, here's what I wanna offer. I'm gonna sit right there after this is over because I don't wanna miss this moment. If you've never stared long at the mercies of God until today and scripture has changed you, you want to know Jesus as Savior. You just come right down here or you can go right up there, either one. If you're a believer and you go, man, I need to be transformed daily. I've gotta put away things so that I'm holy and pleasing before him. Whatever you need to talk about, we're here. There is so much mercy in here. May we be and continue to be folks who are after this book for the glory of God and for the salvation of the sinner. Father, we give you this moment. It's all you. For folks who need to know you, when this song ends, if they want to move outside into the parlor to next steps, that's perfect. If they wanna come down here and talk, we're here. Your word is true, it's good. Thank you for using Paul the way you did. Out of great mercy, come sacrifice. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand.